My name is Albert Park. I'm the director of the Institute for Emerging Market Studies at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And uh, a couple times a year, we organize this series of talks on uh, issues facing emerging markets. And today, we're very happy to have uh, Professor Richard Freeman from Harvard to talk about uh, work and income in the age of artificial intelligence and uh, robots. Uh, our institute um, has a, supports a lot of research on issues related to China. We have a new project on the One Belt, One Road, which has obviously been in the news a lot the last couple of days. Um, and we've also, in the last several years, been working um, as a partner with research institutes uh, in different parts of the world and the World Bank to look at issues related to jobs and employment. And one aspect of that is the role of technology and how it affects uh, the nature of jobs in China and in other parts of the world. So uh, it's great to have Richard here. Richard is an old friend, uh, known him for a long time. He's been coming to China for quite a number of years and knows a lot about what's happening regionally. But his, as you'll see in this talk, his range of interests and expertise is incredibly broad. And he's made important contributions to many areas of research in labor economics. Uh, Professor Freeman holds the Herbert Asherman Chair in Economics at Harvard. He's faculty co-director of the Labor and Work Life Program at the Harvard Law School and the Senior Research Fellow in Labor Markets at the London School of Economics Center uh, for Economic Performance. He directs the Sloan Science Engineering Workforce Projects at the National Bureau of Economic Research and is a co-director of the Harvard Center for Green Buildings and Cities. So he's uh, engaged in quite a lot of activity. Um, so uh, without further ado, let me welcome uh, Richard to uh, deliver the presentation and we'll have some time for comments and discussion. Okay. So I've divided the uh, talk into these four parts and you've seen these scary comments, every, literally every, I haven't graphed how many days there's something in the newspapers saying the robots are coming uh, to take your, your job away. Um, I'm first going to just give you a flavor of what, ha what is in the news and, 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 and what is real about some of these things. Then I'll do the, what, what, what I learned when I first began thinking about this as a student um, comes from Herbert Simon, who is both, both a, a roboticist and an economist. And I think his answers are wrong, which is what I taught for many years. Uh, um, and yeah, I'll, I'll say why. And then what I think is a big issue is, is this AI robot technology different from normal automation and things? Is this one going to be quite different? And then I'll give my three laws of robo-economics. Robo which is obviously thinking of Isaac Asimov <laughs> in his laws, and then a potential solution to the problems this, this brings up to us. OK, first, we just, what, what, what do we mean by the, the robot? And there's a, the, the dictionary, a dictionary definition. There are a number of different dictionary definitions. I picked out the one that most fits what I'm talking So automatic device that performs functions normally ascribed to humans. And then there are these three parts to the robot. And anytime you talk with, with the robotic engineers and people working on this, this is first is the sensing. So you have to have sophisticated sensors so the robot can see things. And in some cases, it can see things that we don't see because our eyes give us some, some you know, vision, but we don't, we, don't, we don't see all the waves of, of light. And the robot can also be, the sensor can also be measuring the air pollution. It can be measuring a whole bunch of things that it, it can then use. So sensors are extraordinarily important. Then it is the artificial intelligence part, which is how do you take this knowledge and turn it into something that is useful for, to, for, to, to humans. And eventually, and this is, turns out it's the hardest part of the robotics. My friend, uh, and I have some friends who build robots uh, professionally. And, and it's, it's getting the robots to 
actually uh, um, move and move efficiently. So a lot of what makes us special, it turns out, is you know, we can do these things. The robot finds that, that difficult, difficult to, do, to, to, to do. And I just, these are three, four pictures of robots. The one to the left is a military robot that is supposed to be on battlefields. The one in the middle is, is what they call a, 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 basically a soft robot. It's made not out of traditional robotic equipment. And it turns out it's very good for making cakes and things where you don't have a clunky metal stuff. And that's from, from actually George Whiteside's laboratory at, at Harvard. The one in the middle is supposed to, the one in the next one is supposed to make you feel happy. That's a social robot. Uh, and it's got kind of a, without having a particular face on it, it's supposed to show. But this one is, is uh, many of these robots here, by the way, are from Boston, Massachusetts, uh, which is the, become the robotics headquarters in, in the US. Um, the, the, this one is, 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 is a headless dog that actually picks up packages in the city of Boston. And so it would carry them uh, to, from store to store, wherever it would be. Um, OK, so there's those. The, I just gathered these headlines. And I've been gathering headlines for four or five years. Now I, just, I see a story, I clip it, boop. And you just, you just see, you've seen headlines like this. Half the jobs are going to disappear. Uh, it's, uh, the OECD says it's, don't, it's not half, it's only 10%. And, and I think many ways that, that question is badly uh, posed. Um, and then dot, dot. This, the robotic construction platform is from uh, this, this past m month, within April or, I forgot, April or May, where they, they, they can now build a fairly substantive building. Um, using 3D printing and robotics, and that, that's pretty uh, big. And then, well, hand pouring coffee. When I, took, when I found that headline, it was maybe four or five years ago, and that seemed exciting, but it, that, that no longer seems exciting, because that's just, that doesn't, doesn't it, it's moving so much. And then what I think is very important is, particularly when we go back to the older automation debates and discussions, um, there it was, blue collar, less skilled work being done by the, by the robots. So I just say at all skill levels. So on the left side, it's mostly uh, the replacing factory workers. That's the headless robot dog. That's Boston's creepiest delivery. That's the headline in the paper. Uh, and doing hamburgers. And e even doing the, some of the uh, surgery that the robots do, that's basically a, a, it's a physical activity. And, and, and robots in the, auto, in the uh, automobile industry, it's welding, which was a skilled task for, for highly paid welders are pretty skilled folks, but the robots do that. But to the right side are things that a little more um, white collar uh, type work. Diagnose, di diagnostics, and it says, well, doctors become obsolete. Well, but the point is, I personally would never go to a doctor who did not have attached some sort of, uh, uh, you know, on his computer or someplace. I don't want to have only this doctor's view. I want him to put in the, uh, uh, all the, the ailments that I have, and I want to see what the bulk of the, of the medical profession through some artificial intelligence machine uh, 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 does it. Journalists of the future, uh, indeed, robots write some of the sports articles in the US, and I would, wouldn't be surprised they do it here. You, 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 I give you the score. I give you, uh, a, a, if it's a short, like a, a story about, say, a college team, one college team beats another college team. Nobody really cares that much. They want to see the score and maybe who scored the most points. Robot can do that. Uh, you, you just get the material and do this. The artificial intelligence AI, this is actually stunning. And I, I have two uh, students that actually read their paper paper while I'm here in China, because the, exam, the grades were all due uh, yesterday. <laughs> and, and, and I have them working. This, and I was sort of stunned, because the, the, the poker game, uh, the, uh, some of you may play poker. I, I don't, so I don't know. It's Texas Fold'em or something, or, or et cetera. And they thought this was like 
the, like the, uh, the Go game. It's just so much subtle human uh, intuition and, and experience. And they've now got a program that beat four of the world's best, um, I think it was from Canada, the, the, uh, actually the team that it could have been UBC, I've forgotten where that was. And then replacing anesthesiologists, stuff that. So then, it, it, then for people in the finance industry, uh, the, the largest hedge fund that is now supposed, to, they haven't yet, is to replace their managers with our artificial in, in, in intelligence. Because um, some of these hedge funds, you may know, are not doing so well. <laughs> and uh, uh, dot, dot. And then the Japanese, et cetera. And then this one I saw and I got really scared. <laughs> I thought, oh my god. Uh, and the RTR is a research and teaching robot. So th that acronym may put me out of work and, uh, 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 and, and some others, Chris and some other people, who knows. OK, now the, there's a standard economic response to all this. Almost all of these newspaper headlines and so on come from robotics. I mean, they come from journalists, but they're, they're, they're reporting the work of roboticists and companies doing things. They're not economists. And so you go back and you say, gee, in the Great Depression, <laughs> uh, Roosevelt had this statement. There was the surplus of our labor, which the efficiency of our industrial processes has created. He did not talk about macroeconomics and lack of demand, or the, you know, the crazy financial system collapsing. That's what he, and there was a movement of engineers at that time, the tech, technocracy movement, which said, well, just let engineers do the planning and that replace the markets. And, 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 and they would know how to deal with uh, all the engineering uh, improvements in, in technology. In the 1960s, we, the US had a big automation uh, scare. Um, and Kennedy and Johnson set up a commission. And uh, Bob Solo played some important role on that particular uh, commission. And actually, it's one of the rare times, I think, when a government commission actually pushed some good economic, really good novel economic thinking, basic, but, but, but really quite, quite, quite valuable. And then Jeremy Rifkin has been predicting at various times the end of work. Um, um, and all of these things turned out not to be on target. So, so I have friends and, and, and colleagues who say, well, it's robots, you just, you just look at history. And you, and you know this is just not, not going to be any different than the previous times. And that's fair. Um, the key principle that, that, that in which you can rely on, on this, oh, yes, he's, th there was an article in today's newspaper that, that um, he's been endorsed now by a number of other <laughs> professional wrestlers and movie stars. <laughs> so, and, Given that when Mr. Trump announced he was going to run for president, no one thought this was serious. Uh, 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 you know, this may be. But I'm using him, uh, The Rock, as an example of comparative advantage. Because why would economics say, don't worry about these jobs? Everybody's got some comparative advantage. He may do everything better than us. Uh, uh, and I think I said than you, but I'm included in you. But as long as we can do something that uh, closer to his abilities than something else, and his abilities are clearly jumping over huge buildings and beating up villains and so on and, 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 and so forth. Whether that translates to the presidency, we, 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 don't, uh, we, we, don't, we don't know. But so you, you would say, with just comparative advantage says, there will be no real jobs crisis in, 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 in a uh, sense. But then it doesn't say where our comparative advantage lies. And countries, and, and China's made, Korea did this first, and China, investing in, in, in high tech knowledge things, you make that comparative advantage, and you prefer that to being a low wage country that is forever doing, uh, you know, that, that's your comparative advantage. You can change it. And that's what the robots are doing. So I ask, where is our comparative advantage versus the robots? The New York Times had this interesting article, in, uh, or the editorial thing, where they said, don't worry about the robots that much. They lack common sense. Those are three of my friends. Some of you may, may or may not know the, 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 the Three Stooges from the 1930s movies. 
There's no common sense there. And, and there's a very intelligent looking robot. But I think the key event that moved a lot of people's thinking was the, uh, uh, when, uh, when the AlphaGo defeated the uh, uh, Lee Sidal, the, the, the Go player. And I don't know if people here play Go. I have played, played Go, and I was beaten by Korean students. Korea's a big Go place, and then sort of backed away when I realized the students could stop me in, in the Go. But I also, at one point, bought one of the early computer Go game, uh, you know, artificial intelligence things. And I could beat it no matter what. So it was really not very good. Uh, so I sort of, when this happened, I said, holy mackerel. And if you, I don't know if people play Go, but if you know it, it you're, you're making very long-term things. You put a little piece in one part of the board, and it may get you s space and be a winning thing, you know, 100 moves later. And so there's a lot of intu intuition and so on. And, and this is a note as to how that, that uh, the AlphaGo did this. And this is because this is critical to why I think this technology really is different. Is the AlphaGo has played more games of Go by far than any human. So you can run the AlphaGo program against itself, and they did that I don't know 100,000 times. So that, and then they had it playing against uh, uh, people. You know, it could play against everyone in this room, a, a game against all every, everybody. And we're each getting one experience playing the machine. It is getting however many people are in the room experience. And that is, is fundamental to, the, to what's going on in, I think, the AI business. You have big data, and you have AI, and suddenly you're able to do, basically develop intuition. So there, there's, there's another sort of statement about, gener, about uh, 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 the, these technologies. So the, in, in, in the artificial intelligence world, there are the people who said, we've got to have general intelligence, or you have these very narrow, specific programs. And the humans have the comparative advantage in general intelligence. I don't think that is true anymore. Uh, it, is tr it is true that I can beat, you can beat the uh, AlphaGo at chess. As a matter of fact, it doesn't know, even have a clue how to play chess, or that's, and, and uh, et cetera. But if you have an ensemble of programs for every single activity that people can do, and you have a, a master um, robot or whatever, whatever, or someone who says, oh, uh, poker. OK, I just bring down the, 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 from the, <laughs> the, the poker p program. Oh, you want to play another game? I bring down that. It, it, so it, it isn't that, that, uh, that, uh, that you can play that, oh, the specialized thing loses in some broad stuff because you have enough specialized things, it covers the whole spectrum. And that's why I was very been struck by low, the blue collar jobs, the white collar jobs, the doctors, you know, it's just, it's across the spectrum we have a set of programs coming out, uh, robots, uh, artificial intelligence, that, that compete with us. Um, and then f finally, yes, I think we do have an edge at the moment, at least in mobility. And when uh, Lee, Lee, Lee Sadal lost the, uh, uh, the, the, the Go thing, he did have, the, the, excuse me, the Go, uh, the Alpha Go, had a human assistant. The human assistant was somebody moved the Go pieces because that is much cheaper <laughs> than it is to try to build a robot that's going to also be moving these Go pieces. That would have been a very expensive and difficult uh, 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 process. And then you start thinking, well, is our comparative advantage going to be in pretty low wage, et cetera, activities? And you know, the, 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 one of the things about economics is you, you, you sort of know some level, it's a great way to organize your thoughts, but often it has zero predictions coming out because if your supply is going to go up and the prices go down, or demand goes up and prices go up. And here it's, yes, comparative advantage, but we don't know what your comparative advantage will be. We have to observe that and, and, and see what, what, that, what that looks like. This is the book that I, uh, as, a, as, a, as a sort of a graduate student, took as the right way to think about things. And I taught this for many, many years. And it poo-pooed the automation scares. And Herb Simon is somebody who knows both 
or new. He's, he's that. Um, and he, he, he based an analysis of what technology is going to do to us on these three principles. Labor supply, uh, labor is less elastic supply than machines. We produce lots and lots of machines, like an infinite you know, number at a given uh, price. Let's just say that. We just keep producing. People, it takes us a while. And if you have a one baby policy, it's, it's you know, you just, you, you, or, 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 or just normal without any government interventions, people don't have that many kids and so on. And so we, 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 we have a, uh, a situation that's less elastic. And then the key principle is, generally speaking, if you have general, any sort of technical change, the, the factor that wins, that gains the most from it is going to be the one that is less elastic. Then he said, well, the technology for producing machines, this is this constant price thing that I said, has constant returns to scale. He's not even building in that the machines are going to be le less, you know, with technical change and increased knowledge, machines get cheaper and cheaper to produce. Babies do not get cheaper to produce, as far as we can tell. And, and, and that, that's a big thing on, on women in the labor force. And then finally, he said, look, what, is the wor what does the data show us? It says that rate with the real wages of workers go up with productivity advances. There was a one-to-one -one link at the period of time he did his, his, his analysis. And I go and say, well, that, therefore, all this automation stuff and that is just silly because here's, here's the facts. And then here you see a statement. The buggy, boogeyman of automation consumes worrying capacity that should be safe for real problems. I don't think that is right now. I don't think it captures the current world. And it's because the facts have changed. And the facts on which he based his analysis are no longer valid for reasons that labor economists and others, we really struggle uh, to, to, to understand. The labor share of national income has fallen in literally every advanced country. It has fallen in China. There's been some upswing in China in the last few years, but it is still uh, below what it was, say, let's say, the labor share. That means more, more of the money is going to capital, and the owners of capital are benefiting, and the workers are not. Um, and we've had real wages in, again, a lot of OECD countries, which just have stagnated. And that's partly, I think, I think underlies some of the anger of people, this populist sentiment turning against immigrants and, or whatever other groups of, 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 of people turning against trade. And so it just doesn't look like the kind of world <laughs> and the facts that he was you know, nailing, nailing down. And um, I'll give you in, in a minute my uh, view of this. Yeah. Um, and then just on the no nature of the comparative advantage going back, he had, he had no notion that you could have a robot boss and you were assisting the robot. And so this was from the BBC article, imagine your boss was a robot. Well, it's kind of like that, and you've got to run in the, in the Amazon fa uh, warehouse. The machine is dictating your pace. Well, of course, on assembly line, often the machine would dictate uh, uh, people's uh, pace. But now your cell phone tells you what to do. There's, uh, the, uh, and uh, there's just a lot of, uh, of, of this, we're not the bosses of, 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 uh, of ourselves. So then I asked a friend of mine, and some of you may, may know him, uh, <laughs> his, and he said, oh, me worry if robots do all the work. I'm just going to have a blast. Uh, and, and, and then you see some people having enjoying life at the, at the back. Um, the meaning of life in a world without work was a headline in The Guardian last week. Somebody may have read it. Um, and it was some Israeli I don't know, philosopher or somebody was, was talking about what, what, what's your life going to be like when there's no work for you to do and everybody gets, you may complain about your job, but you do feel like you're doing something that's useful and valuable, um, et cetera. Um, so that's another view of, of, of this. But what is missing from this is will be a key point that I want to stress is, yeah, um, that's Alfred E. Newman, if you didn't know. Um, is, yeah, he can have his fun with his sex robot or whatever he's doing to enjoy himself in his spare time, but he's got to have some money to buy those machines. And if he's got no job, 
he's not got any money, and we really have a, 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 a substantial problem of people being replaced by robots. Not that they, they won't have a job, but it'll be very low wage, and moving the, the, the chess piece or the go piece is possible. These are people, of course, enjoying themselves. And this. Okay, so I hope I've led into with this next section so you won't try. Because I, and I struggled with this and talked to some of uh, my friends at Carnegie Mellon. Because why is this technology different? That the economists who see this as a, just like, go back to the old automation stuff. Uh, uh, and that takes care of, of the problem. I debated uh, Larry Michel, head of a, of a left-wing pro-labor think tank in Washington, DC. And I was on the robots are changing the world, and he was, Oh no, this is the same old stagnation stuff, and all we need are strong unions and dot, 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 and Keynesian macro policies or something, which is uh, uh, his view. But I don't think that that is, is, is in fact, the, those may be good solutions for some problems, but not for this. The first thing that's most striking to me is how much people's work is online. And if we're online, our brains are doing something, but the computer algorithm is faster and better. It's like, the, in this sense, the artificial intelligence is a creature <laughs> that really is online. And we are kind of in a different space than we normally, no, normally are, which is why so many of us rely on the, uh, be it the cell phone or the computer to tell us what to do, at what time, and so on and, and, and so forth. So you're now in a world in which a lot of work is being done in a space where humans don't naturally have a comparative advantage. That's one. Two, the robots, are, and this is now more the physical robots, are, 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 are big, better and better sensors. They work really hard at getting them to move. And they are clearly moving offline. So they are doing more offline uh, things. Greeting people in the banks. I was told someone here, here, here a few minutes ago said they do that. So the, the, and the, 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 all the work on the, mo and the, pr and the motion stuff, which is really hard uh, engineering things, and it, it's often very slow that they make progress. But, but that is going to keep going on. And then I said people become more like the technology, which is, and there are a bunch of people just looking at their cell phones or their computers, and they're not looking at any other human being at all. And we've, everyone's had this experience. You're on a subway or you're someplace. Everybody's like this. And when the, all the students are looking at their cell phones while I'm talking. I get very upset, <laughs> but well, it's, it's a, a dot. And then I told you the ensemble part. OK. So there was a report in January of this year that Northwestern University had an AI model that performed at human levels on a standard intelligence test. Now, the, you know, a standard intelligence test means that it's answering some questions uh, all about the math, some questions. So it's the, it's the equivalent of the, of the uh, uh, computer uh, winning some, uh, uh, you know, uh, some TV show in which, it, 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 in which it has to know lots of knowledge and pulls things down, et cetera. And then I kept thinking of me. Uh, when students ask me a question, my natural first response is, oh, Google. You can Google. In this part of China, you can Google. <laughs> but I said, you know, look it up on the internet. I, I'm not going to remember the fact. And, and, and I'll, I'll give a number, maybe, and it may be, may be correct. It may be a bit off, because I'm using it rhetorically, and so on and so forth. And so there's the RTRs going to replace us, me. And, and so let me, I took a statement from Malthus. And, and in, in some level, the Herb Simon analysis is very Malthusian, where it, it, whichever the, the, the most elastic supply phenomenon is, it, gets, it doesn't benefit from technology, because there's just more of it. It gets the constant wage. Uh, and uh, so in, in Simon's world, uh, it was the machines that were the constant wage. In Malthus's world, it was having babies. We were the ones. Uh, having the, 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 the constant wage. So I then, I do, I'm too modest to put my name. I just said labor economist, 2015. But this, it, yeah, I just do not see how we, we will not be having uh, major changes in the world of work 
and also the world of income, which is what I'm going to stress shortly, uh, from the robotic stuff. It, it is so much more powerful in, in, in the online work that, we, we, that, that a lot of us now do. Um, and it's moving in the offline areas as, as well. So that's the statement. Now, this is the uh, industrial robots. Uh, and this is the global production from a group called Robotic, uh, the, it's RFI, Robots Federation Institute or something. Um, they charge a lot of money to read their reports and get their basic data. And uh, so I'm just using their things that they, have, they, they, they sort of make publicly available. I didn't spend thousands of dollars getting their, their reports. Um, and, and there you see the, the, the world robotics and then the US and you know, a robotics industry association. Um, the in, what's, what's important is the, 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 in, the, in the recession, the US stopped producing, stopped uh, buying, putting in a lot of robots. Um, we, and then we've been zooming up since then. In the, and that reflects more or less the world uh, phenomenon. That in the recession, no one's going to be investing very much because there's no demand. And so, the Keynesian kinds of stuff. This clearly is macroeconomic things matter in, in, in the process. These are strictly industrial robots. They are not any of the soft robots. They're not any of the artificial intelligence programs that are not counted. These are clunky, um, big, big, heavy robots. The biggest industry that uses them are cars. And so this is a, 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 a sliver of what is going on, in my view. Uh, but this is what we have measures of. And we have no grow measures of the growing use of AI. And anybody who, it's, it's not that it's impossible to imagine creatively you could do something to find out. But it's, it's, th th no one has done that yet. And it's, it's, it's not going to be easy. OK, now get the right one. OK, so that's, that, that's the, we now know that the robots are growing. Blah. These are my three laws of global economics. And I'll give you the solution. And hopefully, won't, they won't look peculiar to you, having given all the things I've said before. One is that what's different about this technology is that we are creating better and better substitutes for people. So a higher elasticity of substitution, as the economics lingo would say. Previously, the, the, we did not have things that uh, inventions, uh, machines, that would be substitutable for us in all the activities that we do. You have a tractor, and that, that's a great substitute for the farmer for his physical stuff. But it doesn't do anything else about the farming decisions. Now you have, you have, you have the tractor. You could have the tractor have sensors on the, uh, on the, uh, the, the, the products, the, the agriculture, decide at the optimal time to the tractor could have an arm, the arm comes down, pulls it in. It could be having in its head market prices in different parts uh, of the world or country. It could be making optimizing decisions that traditionally a farmer would do as best he or she could. That's one. Two is technological change. It's not what Herb Simon said is constant you know, reproduction at a given price. The technologies makes the robots every year. It gets cheaper for the robot to substitute for us. And that puts a bound on our wages. Uh, you, no one will pay you to do any activity that uh, is going to be more expensive than the production cost of the robot. I, I spoke with, with one, at least one Chinese business person who said to me, yes, he was thinking of firing everybody and bringing robots. And then he said, this is the cost at which I am prepared to do this. So if the wages went way up or the robot price went down, he would fire lots of people. Um, and he really, see, he, he had a task group in his company you know, planning <laughs> for, the, for this future event, which will be a number of years away. And then this is absolutely critical, and it's the incomes part of the story, is who owns this technology and who gets the economic rewards from it is fundamental whether everybody benefits or just a few people uh, b benefit. So I coined this, this thing, who owns the robots rules the world, which basically means if this technology is coming along and it's substituting for people, 
it becomes like the old US where people owned other people, except now you own the robots. But those were the wealthiest people, of course, in the US, were the slave owners and pe people, people like that. But now they, they, they're the, the, the robot owners. So I said, yeah, if the robot is a tool that helps me do my job, I benefit. If it's a tool that, or excuse me, it's a replacement for me <laughs> that you own, I'm in trouble, and conversely. Now I just want to give you a little bit of, of, of evidence from some industry places to say er everything I said sort of has backing, if, if I can phrase it correctly. So this was in fact the cost of advanced industrial robots falling while their performance is steadily improving. And this is for welding. And so, uh, welding is, I say, one of these archetype uh, kind of uh, blue collar things. And they're, they're, and they're showing you from here, and then they go to the projected, and they're giving you the, 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 what's going to happen in the future costs, et cetera, et cetera. And nobody would disagree, as, and you'll see in a minute, China is bringing in all of these big welding machines to replace workers in the automobile factories here. Um, and, and with much lower labor costs than in the US, so it's pretty striking. There was only, there's only been one study in economics uh, that has at least gotten real empirical evidence <laughs> and to address this. And this is by, by Daron Asimoglu, who I, I know very well from LSE days, and, uh, uh, and someone named Restropo, who I don't know. And I apologize to him that I've even forgotten his first name, but I've never met him. Um, and Daron was somebody who, two years ago at least, was arguing that the, 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 the more of the Simon kind of line. There's no, it's all going to work out. Um, compar he wouldn't have phrased it the way I would phrase it. It was just comparative advantage guarantees the, the things. And we have our comparative advantages in good stuff. But that's the heart of a, of a, of a, of a theoretical model. And then somewhere or other, he decided to, he and the rest of the world decided to look at some data. And this paper's gotten a lot of attention in the, in the news and the, the NBR. It's like one of the most downloaded work paper, pa working papers we've ever, we've ever had, uh, I was told. And the heart of it is, is just empirics. I'm going to finesse 75 pages of modeling that everything, it's just, it's just it's empirical observation. And the, the, the bottom of both these curves is a, 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 a variable created exposure to robots from 1993 to 2007. And it's, he gets this, but from, it, from the industry robotics data, and I, I, they may, maybe he bought it from them. I don't know how they got the, the, the data, because it's, it's pretty expensive to get anything out of the robotics feder, uh, federation people. And, uh, and, and along the axis are just changes in the log of hourly wages and the changes in employment population ratio. And what you, quick, you clearly see is areas in the US that have had bigger uh, use of, these are the industrial robots, not the, all, the full spectrum of things. It's just the industrial robots. And these are largely, a bit, if you want to be critical, this is largely automobile type Midwestern American places where they bring in industrial robots. And, but you see, boom, boom, those areas have had declines in jobs and declines in wages. And it's a pretty robust result um, et cetera. And the, 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 the circles are bigger cities uh, or, or bigger you know, counties. They're not quite counties, what he has, but bigger metropolitan areas that, that uh, you would have Akron, Ohio. Detroit is probably one of the bigger ones uh, where, where that is. So then I thought, oh my god, robots and machines, they're near perfect substitute by me. They're owned by Mr. and Mrs. Big, and jobs and wages are falling. This is pretty terrible. And then labor's share is going down in the US. That's, I'm not saying this explains it. It's just consistent. You see, what's going on is a, a consistent thing where the people are being squeezed by the capital uh, in the income distribution, and they're being uh, of this. And uh, that, that, that I debated whether I should take the you're fired off, because I did. that comes from early presentation before the election. And then I thought, no, he's been firing everybody he can see. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 and this maniacal person here is some movie guy playing a villainous uh, you know, billionaire or something. And uh, that's, 
Okay, now what about China? China today is the biggest purchaser of industrial robots in the world. Now, China not per capita, obviously not, but the biggest in the world. So you look at the 2015, it's, it was 27% of the world robotic market. On, this is only of these industrial robots. So, be, be, so this, it, one must be very careful in saying that. That's all we have measures of for the moment. And then it's predicted to be 39% in 2019. So, woof, uh, China, is, with much lower wages than the US, is seeing something that looks very similar in terms of ro robotic uh, uh, use. And then, just a few days ago, uh, the New York Times had an article that you may or may not have seen, which was all about a robot revolution this time in China, and they're talking about Hangzhou, and et cetera. And, and I, they, they, uh, there's a city in China that is giving subsidies for companies to put in robots uh, in, in, the, in order to up, up the quality of the, uh, of the, of the, of the, of the production uh, and move up the, 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 the manufacturing uh, chain. So, so it's kind of the news and the, and the facts seem to be consistent. Sometimes they're not, an economist or anybody. The facts, you say, oh no, the news just distorted this. This does not seem to be di uh, uh, distorted. So then I come to, the uh, come, to the come to the end. What do we do if, in fact, this robotization is moving us to lower comparative advantage? Uh, you know, if our comparative advantage is going to be low income things and the people who own the robots are going to be increasing. And I said, well, it's more inequality. It will produce social unrest. I, I, there's no, I don't have any evidence to say that, um, oh, there would be something we could do very interesting. If we got their own data to see whether the Trump vote was connected to the, where the robots are. I, I will send him an email <laughs> and say, could you do this? Because that would, that would make a little tighter link that there's a lot of populist unrest in the world because workers are, are, are indeed losing. Uh, or, or they may not be ha their wages going down, but they're not gaining the way the people at the top are gaining, the owners of this. So I said, well, do we tax robots? Bill Gates suggested that, uh, and which says, Bill Gates, you should probably should, he's great in charity. Uh, Microsoft's okay. Uh, I don't exactly like their products, but it's, a, it's obviously, Dominant, but on taxing robots, he's, it's just a nutty, one of the nuttier things you could, you could imagine. And, and then here I just showed some, some poor guy trying to fight with a big mechanical, uh, 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 it's sort of a robot. You see, it's like a, it's a train underneath, it's not really a horse, and uh, et cetera. No, that, 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 that's, it's not feasible, which could end the discussion, but, I don't even, but it's clearly not desirable either. Here's this, this movement to really raise productivity and to do things that could be very beneficial for everybody. And you don't want to stop it and, and lock yourself into a, a stagnant society, if you could. I don't think you can. So I will conclude with, with my, a, a solution. I don't know that it's a solution for all that many countries, but the United States has a long tradition of going back to our revolution was that you had to have ownership of capital in the hands of lots and lots of people. The capital that the US, almost every US leader, uh, uh, um, you know, through, through, the, through, the, through, through the Roosevelt period, let's, let, let, let's say, they all pushed on, but I'm, I'm here quoting the, um, the, founding, the founders of the country. And you see, the only possible way of preserving equal liberty is to make the acquisition of land, because that was the form, we were an agricultural society. And, and if you think about why the US is different from some of the European countries, our peasants, <laughs> farmers, owned the land. In Europe, the land was owned by uh, lords of, uh, and the kings and so on and so forth. Um, and there's Jefferson and Hamilton, who's Many uh, of, the, of the, what's the right word, Wall, Wall Street type people like to see him as their representative of, uh, uh, of the country. And he said the same thing. Uh, and he was for equality and moderation of individual property. 
because that would promote growth. He believed the same as the other, the, the other uh, leaders. He was much more open to banks and finance and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, and then there's Madison. So I come to this thinking, uh, or at least for the American uh, situation, if the robots are going to add more and more shifting of income away from normal people, and if not taking away jobs, because I'll take comparative with them, yeah, people can have something to do, certainly in the near foreseeable future. There's got to be a way of, of redistributing or distributing the money from this technology more broadly. We have um, ESOPs in place, stock ownership plans. 10% of American workers in the private sector are in companies where they own part of the company. And that's bigger than our trade union membership. Uh, by 50 percent, so it, 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 our unions are declining, and some, it's, you, you, uh, you know, strong unions could do something, but we don't have them, and they, you know, we don't see them coming back. And then there's a set of policies that uh, uh, I think of. The, the the policy that's gotten a lot of attention now is the universal uh, the UBI, the universal benefit uh, in, in incomes. That to me has a flavor of being weaker than ownership. If you own something, the politicians won't take it away. It's harder for them to take it away from you than if it's a, something that goes through the government and this particular government decides that they want to spend money in a different way and they cut your, 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 uni your universal benefits. But that's uh, this. And so I show a happy world in which there's American flags. This is American uh, policy thing. And I don't know Hong Kong, and I know that I know that employee ownership is very limited in China, in general. Huawei has some some programs and so on, but it's not certainly not something people are thinking about. And certainly the factory owners are not thinking of, about having the rural migrants be partial owners of the, of the companies. And it, may, it requires a very different kind of, I think, workforce. And then. There's the bottom part, which is, yeah, if, if, they, own the, if they own the stuff, well, they'll own the country, dot, dot, <laughs> everything. Um, so I see the robot business as a great opening for people to rethink how we are dealing with technologies. And much of the underlying stuff is paid for by taxpayers through the R&D and through the things going on in universities. We want businesses to commercialize them, uh, yes. But somewhere along the line, uh, the, the, it has to be that it flows back to citizens. And this technology looks to me like it's not going to flow back in the way the earlier technologies did, through you know, price declines or w wage increases with productivity. That's all. <laughs>